Ken Gray first made the All Blacks on the 1963-64 tour of Great Britain. In those games, he kept company with a great forward pack. The early 1960s were changing times for rugby. At last, forwards were encouraged to run with the ball. No longer were big scrummaging props just looked for. They had to be fast and skillful as well. The 63-64 pack had some great moments. Little crashes into us in a shattering tackle, and Briscoe picks up to feed Stewart. The big lock rampages down the field, barging into the plucky Welsh fullback Hodgson, but by holding on too long, he's blunted the impetus of the attack. But Colton intercepts his pass and the tides are turned completely. Up to Wilcox and Colton's tackled, ball and all. Briscoe picks it up, out to Arnold, to John Graham. He pivots, looking for support. It's there, Colin Meads tackled, but his great strength drags him over the line for a wonderful try. Physically, there's no position that approaches the front row. The difference between a lock and the front row is tremendous. You have all this grinding power, you know, eight, 16 stoners either side, and they're just running through your body. Ken Gray had his own great moments as an All Black. This was his favourite memory of a Test match. I might be the only All Black to have actually signed an autograph book in the middle of a Test match. Somehow or other, I happened to be in the right spot at the right time, and I had the sort of final try. And as I dotted the ball down, a whole lot of uh, Murray blokes, but predominantly Murray, I remember, raced onto the field and. Uh, and one shoved an autograph book uh, under my hand and I actually signed it and they, they were going to invade the field and that was going to be the end of the game. It's an example of what a cool person Wilson Winneray was. He had something in his mind that would never have occurred to me. He said, look fellas, and he gave a little speech to all these blokes ready to invade the field. He said, look, if you just stand back just a minute and let Fergie kick this conversion, this will be the biggest win that the All Blacks have ever had over South Africa in their history which apparently was true, I don't know. <laughs> so Fergie slotted the goal. <laughs> Ken Gray was a rugby player of the 60s. His opposition to apartheid meant he was the first rugby player to pull out of a tour over the South Africa issue. Yet he came back to the game, and this week he's remembered as one of the greats of rugby. And no matter how long the game was and how arduous the, the path, he was always there at the end. He might be a bit bloodied, but he was never bowed or broken. And again on those long tours where people have to produce good performance game after game after game, Ken was there right to the end. He was without doubt, apart from his football ability, uh, typical uh, as a young man of one of the very best young men New Zealand can produce. And the sad thing today isn't that we've lost a great old All Black, but we've really lost a great New Zealander. Not only a great All Black, but a great New Zealander. Just one tribute for former All Black, farmer and politician Ken Gray, who died suddenly today, aged 54. Peter Williams remembers one of the strongest men ever to wear the All Black jersey. The game of rugby has had few more imposing figures than Ken Gray. He combined massive strength with mobility unknown in prop forwards before and scored nine tries in his 50 matches for the All Blacks, one of them against South Africa in the fourth test of 1965. Uh, he was undoubtedly, during his time, one of the greatest front row forwards that this country has ever produced and, in my view, outside of his era even, he was one of the great front row forwards of all time. In 1970, the All Blacks were in South Africa, but Gray refused to tour because he opposed apartheid. I made the decision it was uh, better not to go and that would be detrimental to rugby. That opposition to rugby contact with South Africa continued. In 1981, he was on the streets protesting against the Springboks' presence in New Zealand. But by this year, his attitudes had mellowed and he joined other past All Black greats to watch the test from Ellis Park. But Ken Gray was more than a rugby player. He was a successful farmer and local body politician who wanted to make his mark in national politics. After failing twice to become a Labour Party candidate, he was to have had his chance in Western Hutt in next year's election. Another former teammate says he could have gone far in politics, of one sort or another. If he didn't enjoy Parliament, and he was his own man, he mightn't have, uh, he could walk out and he would have been a marvellous chairman of the New Zealand Rugby Union. Ken Gray's association with the Labour Party led to him chairing the smoke-free organisation since its inception in 1989. He was 54 when he died today. South Africa, 1970. 
And after 24 tests, this suddenly was an all-black side without Ken Gray. Just before the tour, Ken Gray had surprised rugby fans everywhere by retiring from the game. The great thing about Ken, he's a, you know, the modest hero, the Ed Hillary modest hero, who decides he's revolted by South Africa long before it became politically correct. In fact, amongst the hardcore rugby fraternity, Gray's refusal to tour South Africa was too politically correct by far, and he was bitterly attacked. But the memories of his play in the 60s remain. And Gray charges from the ruck to score near the post. Already crowding the sidelines, hundreds of young spectators pour onto the paddock. The history of rugby will always reflect him as one of the greatest props of all time, possibly the greatest. Uh, but he was much more than that. Uh, as a lot of prop forwards often are. Ken Gray, Chris Laidlaw, they played together and then they turned to politics. Laidlaw was running for Labour in Wellington Central, Ken Gray, Labour in Western Hutt. Someone who was strict about himself, very strict about what he stood for, um, and I, I think would have made a great Member of Parliament, no question. But mostly Gray will be remembered not for what he could have been, but what he was. An All Black who at his best was as good as All Blacks get. John Campbell, Three National News. Old St Paul's was packed with people who remembered Ken Gray, not just as an All Black, but for his involvement in theatre and local and national politics. He would have stood for Labour in the next election, but died last week aged 54. I saw a man stand in front of a mountain a mountain do its thing behind the man, and such was the greatness of the man, and such the understanding nature of the mountain. They look so good together. To celebrate the many and varied contributions he made to life in this country in general, and to Wellington and Porirua in particular. Ken Gray's funeral was attended by over 600 mourners. Gary Scott, Three National News. Now thy earthly task is done, home art gone, and tain thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must resign to this and come to dust. I mean, a lot of lines like that, and there was one particular verse by a poet who I like very much, love very much, a poet called Theodore Reutke. It's a poem of the Ken. We didn't always talk about poems, but um, sometimes, and I remember once saying this poem, uh, this is a little four lines from a poem, which was a favourite of his. It's called In the Dark, just the four lines, in a dark time. And they seem today to be more applicable than ever. In a dark time, the eye begins to see. I meet my shadow in the deepening shade. I hear my echo in the echoing wood. A lord of nature weeping to a tree. And I wanted to mention those lines and also to say this just obviously not just lines of poetry that come to mind, but a lot of very, very vivid images. Now is not the time to get into anecdote and recollection, except just, just a couple of very quick ones. And one is just, I just was thinking about it, going past this house up the Horakiri Valley a couple of days ago. And the house was on a farm that Ken was owning or leasing or something. Anyway, uh, he and I were painting the roof one day, and we were up on the roof, and like all good uh, roof painters, we started from the middle of the, middle of the roof, so you work out. Anyway, uh, it was a fine afternoon, and we were gossiping away. <laughs> Didn't notice the rain clouds, and of course the rain came down, and sort of, uh, well, there was any downpipe that ever got painted on the inside as this paint, and, uh, and still to this day, there's a sort of rainbow colour pattern on that roof, so just, just thinking about that. And, uh, and another little, uh, not a little thing, a very big and very strong image of of my friend Mann was when he launched a book for me in 1987 in Parramatta, the Parramatta Boating Club. And I remember when he was standing speaking, it wasn't just what he was saying, which in itself was funny and irreverent and reverent and great. Uh, but his standing there with the Kakaho hills and skyline behind, and I remember some lines came to me at the time, something about I saw a man stand in front of a mountain, 
a mountain do its thing behind the man, and such was the greatness of the man, and such the understanding nature of the mountain. They looked so good together, th they could belong to each other. And I just take, uh, would like to sort of take the chance to say goodbye publicly and, uh, and just finish by, before passing to someone else with a little poem that I wrote, I think recently, yeah. I think so. Well, I haven't written it, but I can hear it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just a little poem which I like to say and dedicate <coughs> to Ken. It's called Old Flames. The cabbage tree was, they said, dead. There was nothing there or anyone could do, now or any day, how sorry they were and sad. But the cabbage tree heard them. No one noticed it shaking its head. It shook it so hard, stars were said to have spread from where the cabbage tree stood. A blossoming new constellation across the night sky south. Someone said just yesterday, some fires you can't put out. Thank you very much, See you, old friend. Thank you very much. And since then I've learnt and experienced the famous grey hospitality on many occasions. It's something I'm told that goes back to the old days, the days round Granny Gray's kitchen, when people used to gather around the kitchen table, often amongst the cake tins and the, the mail for the week and even the saddle or two, to sit around and to talk, to laugh and to argue. Ken was a person who used to love to entertain and he made you feel so welcome. He loved nothing more than a glass of wine, some food and some good political conversation. And he used to like to do it around that breakfast bar in their home in Grays Road. And I think that breakfast bar became an extension of the old kitchen table. And it was only eight weeks ago many of us gathered at Ken and Joy's home to celebrate his victory in winning the nomination for the Western Hut um, seat. We gathered around that breakfast bar once more and into the small hours we argued and talked with Ken leading the charge about how we should fix the world. Old friends have told me over the last few days some really interesting stories about Ken and they've asked me if I'd pass them on to you. Ken, I gather, developed an in extrasensory perception which enabled him to be able to sniff out home baking from kilometres away. In fact, he had this ability to track down cake tins and empty them while he was visiting people. And his hosts were delighted because they had partaken of his generosity and his hospitality on many occasions. Like many people, I first heard of Ken back in the 1960s, Ken Gray the All Black. That was back in the days when All Blacks were heroes and winners, and Ken was both. Robert Newcomb, an old friend of Ken, one of his oldest friends who went to school with him, told me that Ken started his rugby career as a halfback. Well, I found that hard to believe when I looked at him. He was such a giant of a man, not only in his size, but in many other ways. Robert said that he was good at all sport at school. He loved sailing, he loved speedboat racing, he loved anything to do with the sea, and he loved horse riding. But the Ken that I know best is Ken Gray, the political activist. Ken loved politics, local, national, international. And although his political colours were Labour, he mixed and made friends with people from all political persuasions. Traditional political enemies couldn't dislike Ken. They might have disagreed with what he said, but he was admired and accepted for his talents, his courage, his convictions, his principles, and his ability to be able to argue a political point and then walk away as a friend. Ken was an asset to the Labour Party. He brought a credibility to the party with him, particularly in the area of farming. And he was prepared to stand up for Labour Party policies before they became fashionable or trendy. His political career started right at the bottom where the hard work is done in local government. And those people who worked with him have told me about his straight talking and about his determination to get things done. Ken made a considerable input into Labour Party policy through his involvement in the Primary Producers Council. He was one of the people who helped change attitudes and to formulate practical policies for farming within the Labour Party. 
but his real love was economic policies. And in the last difficult years of the last Labor government, Ken chaired the Economic Consultative Committee of the party. And of course he received flack from everybody. But he didn't give up or resign. He stayed there, better than the Tom Scott cartoon in the Evening Post on Thursday night, which said, Ken Gray, all black, farmer, citizen, bloody good bloke. Another week of humour with Ken was beginning, but he wasn't joking about those matches. <laughs> with the lights in operation, we drove south in midwinter while the temperature dropped. Looking down, we noticed the road could be viewed beneath our legs. <laughs> the heater didn't stand a chance. Even Ken's in-depth conversation on the state of the universe did not warm us up. <laughs> Two of us slept while the third drove. When Ashburton was finally reached, Ken had the flu for the three following days, I had mild hypothermia, <laughs> and Howard has kept to BMWs ever since. 